This afternoon we're going to be talking about the East India Company and the series of uh, several of the lectures I'm doing right now really do follow in order. Uh, this morning I talked about the spice routes and why everyone was so interested in getting to this part of the world in order to access not only the spices but Chinese silks and a lot of other things. Now we want to talk about the period in which the European colonial powers made the very concerted effort over a period of several hundred years in some cases to control this part of the world in order to be able to access those resources and the wealth that they produced. Um, the, the last of those, as I will talk about at the end of the lecture today, was Great Britain. They lasted longer. In fact, uh, the British East India Company morphed into the British Raj, as it was called, when they folded it into the overall uh, authority they actually crowned Queen Victoria as the Empress of India, and then from that point, uh, we'll we'll get into a little bit first the British jewel in the crown, why India was so important to them, and then to talk about the independence movement under Gandhi, and then a couple of lighter things. But um, so the East India Companies now. Then we'll talk about British India, the jewel in the crown, Gandhi, and India's struggle for independence. And then we'll get a little bit lighter with tea and cricket, which is more about the cultural kind of exchange. And um, I've already asked who played cricket. We have our uh, the Jamaican cricket team, which I'm hoping I can talk them into doing a demo for us. Uh, we'll have to find out. But um, And then finally, I'm going to do a lecture on understanding Islam. Because while I've talked about Hinduism and Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, Islam is, is obviously a major force in this part of the world as well. Especially when we get to Singapore, we will be very close to the largest uh, Muslim country in the world, which is Indonesia. And so we will talk about that. This is the last afternoon lecture I will do. Uh, the other lectures, tomorrow of course, we're in Sri Lanka. The following day, we will be, or following three days after that, we'll be at sea, and I will do morning lectures, and then they have other activities in the afternoon, including some very cool Bollywood movies. If, you, if you've never seen Bollywood movies, I strongly recommend you pick up on some of those. Those will be in the afternoon and maybe some other activities as well. Then we have one day in uh, Phuket in Thailand, and then we're back at sea for one day, and that's the last lecture I will give on that last sea day. Then we're in Malacca in Malaysia, and then Singapore. So uh, have a few more lectures to go here. We need to start out when we talk about the various colonial efforts to control this part of the world with the uh, European Age of Discovery. In the 15th and 16th century, starting with the Portuguese, there was a massive effort on the part of most of the powers of Europe to explore the world. It's called the Age of Discovery, or sometimes the Age of Exploration, and it really did begin with Henry the Navigator, the Prince of Portugal, who uh, funded and supported and encouraged various voyages around the world. The Portuguese were the first ones to explore the coast of Africa, Vasco da Gama, of course, in the late 1400s, uh, was able to reach India by sailing around the southern tip of Africa. Uh, we have various other international explorers, and as you can see up here, Portugal sort of started it, but Spain, France, uh, and England, as well as some traveling by some of the other countries, also they were all involved in trying to find out what was in the world, and especially they were concerned about finding trade opportunities, uh, much of this was financially driven, and then new trade routes. That's one of the reasons they risked their lives. A lot of the early voyages never came back, and they never heard from them again. But uh, they were willing to take this chance in order to find new new trade routes to find to the Indies. And again, as we said several times, this is a reason that in the 1490s, when Columbus reached the what was known as the New World. He called the people Indians, and he referred to that um, later on. He referred to it as the Indies. Later on, they called the Caribbean area the West Indies, and this area around uh, India is became known as the East Indies. It's actually the South Asia Maritime area. Um, during this period of time, there was an enormous amount of navigation uh, expertise that was being developed. They were developing mapping and uh, navigational charts. Henry the Navigator was a huge believer in that. Um, interestingly, uh, earlier on, the Vikings had already determined ways in which you could sail in open waters, but it took a while for the Portuguese to really develop those capabilities later. And um, an interesting thing, uh, this, this chart here represents what, what's called the Treaties of uh, Tordes, Tordesillas and uh, Saragossa. 
when, within a few months of when Columbus came back from his voyage, the Portuguese and the Spanish decided there's a whole lot more out there than we realized and we want it to be ours. So they, in order to have kind of a neutral determination, they went to the most, the most powerful person in Europe, which, who was the Pope. It just so happened that the Pope at that time, Alexander VI, was Spanish born. And so in 1494, he declared that there would be a boundary line that would divide the territories that Spain and Portugal, at that time the two great naval powers, would have control of. What he said, the Cape Verde Islands here in the Atlantic, he said that, that 100 leagues, about 330 miles, to the west of the Cape Verde Islands would be a meridian, and that anything on the west side of that would belong to Spain, and anything on the east side of that would belong to Portugal. Obviously, he was fudging for the Spanish, although at that time they did not know how much was out here. They hadn't been there yet. Well, um, think for a second about the very idea that European powers would be deciding what the whole rest of the world parts belong to them. There, is, there was an inherent sense of superiority that anybody who's out there can't be as sophisticated as us, so clearly we're superior beings, and so when we get there, it will belong to us. The only exception that the Pope made in the Treaty of Tordesillas is that if there was any Christian rulers of any of these lands, then the Christian rulers could keep their lands. Otherwise, it would belong to Portugal and Spain. Well, King John in um, King John II in Portugal was pretty upset about this because he figured that that wasn't you know that was kind of cheating. So he went to Ferdinand and Isabella. That's the Ferdinand and Isabella that had funded Columbus's voyages and said, you know, this isn't going to be, it doesn't sound good to us here, but if we take that line and we run it to the other side of the world, you guys are going to be left out completely almost. That all of this is going to belong to us in Portugal. So why don't we move this line over a little bit? Um, they agreed to move it over, and you'll notice that when they moved it over, it catches this part of South America. Do you know what that is? Brazil. 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 What language do they speak in Brazil? Portuguese. What language do they speak in the rest of South America? Spanish. Boy, I got you guys in the palm of my hand. The reason for that is that Portugal and Spain kept to this this uh, treaty, this agreement. And so um, it was actually a Portuguese sailor, um, Pedro um, Alfonso Cabral, that discovered the coast of Brazil. And so in 1500, and so they, they settled here with the agreement of the Spanish and of the Pope and ended up taking over the entire country of Brazil. The entire rest of it was to Spain. And of course, North America was known as New Spain for a while. Uh, a, a lot of people got in, in on that after a while. But when they drew the line over here, that meant that any of the areas, uh, the Pacific areas, the islands um, far north, that would be in the control of uh, Spain. And that left the whole India Ocean to Portugal by, a, by the agreement. What that led to was the world's first global empire, and it was Portugal. Most people have no clue that the first global empire was Portuguese. The, the Portuguese controlled not only Brazil, the Cape Verde Islands, a number of other islands in the, the North Atlantic, but also sections of Africa, where they had explored the coast of Africa, both the east, the uh, west coast and east coast. They planted colonies in Goa, in Cochin, where we just were. Remember the, um, the Dutch uh, palace? And we listened to the guide, and he said, okay, this was built by the Portuguese. And some of the people in our group said, then why is it called the Dutch palace? Well, because the Portuguese were there first, and the Dutch came later and took over the palace and, and expanded it. But these were all Portuguese colonies. Bombay had a colony. Um, the Goa, especially, very late. Uh, Macau, Malacca, where we're going to be. Even Nagasaki in Japan. All of these were colonies of Portugal. In fact, Portugal not only was the first global empire, it's the longest lasting global empire. They did not finally give independence to East Timor uh, until uh, 2002. So part of the Portuguese empire in the South Asia continued until 2002. <coughs> Portugal probably would have continued as a major power except for several events. In 1755, they had the earthquake in Lisbon, which is one of the earthqu worst earthquakes in history in terms of devastation. 
It happened in the, uh, in the sea, not far from Lisbon. First, the city was hit by the earthquake, buildings fell, fires started, everybody fle fleeing the fires and the falling buildings fled down to the waterfront, and then a major um, tsunami comes in, and thousands and thousands of people died. The city was almost completely destroyed, had to be rebuilt entirely. Then, um, 40 years later, 45 years later, we have the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, Napoleon invaded Portugal, who was an ally of Britain. Um, Portugal suffered greatly under that. Then into the 19th century, they had a series of civil wars. In 1822, they ended up losing Brazil, which was their primary colony and a very important source for them. Brazil was to Portugal what India became to Britain. And so at that point, the Portuguese empire pretty much folded up. There was not a, a lot of need after uh, the 16th century to really have this exploration quite as much. For one thing, they discovered most of the stuff, with the exception of um, Antarctica, some of the internal parts of Africa, etc. Plus, they, you know, the trade routes were all active. They had developed neg navigation, and it just wasn't as exciting anymore. Most of the good places had been found, and so in the 17th century, this all kind of died out. Um, but as a result of this. Age of discovery and this European expansion, Portugal being the first example, in South Asia, we had a whole series of what are called the East India Companies. The oldest one is the British East India Company. They actually were chartered in 1600. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Then in 1602, the Dutch East India Company, 1616, the Danish, 1628, Portuguese, and they only lasted five years. The Portuguese did not stick with that very long because they didn't have the support that some of the others did by the government and wealthy individuals. 1664, the French get in on the act with the French East India, and in 1731, even the Swedish have an East India Company. Now, that didn't mean other countries weren't trading, but these particular uh, nations developed specialized corporations which were sort of pseudo-governmental. In some cases, as in, I'll talk about the British East India Company, the British East India Company ended up having more than twice as many soldiers working for the company as were in the entire British Army outside of that. So it became a major force in the world. I'm not going to take them in this order. What I'm going to do instead is turn them upside down, and I want to talk about the four most important of these in order of their, their decline. Because the last one, which continued until the middle, well, the as the East India Company, it continued until the 1870s, but um, just converted into the British Raj and the control of India until the mid-1900s. And so I want to talk about the last. So we're going to talk about the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and the British East India Companies in those orders. This will give you an idea about some of the colonies that were established. The white one with a shield on it here is Portuguese. So you can see where the Portuguese locations were. This is just India. It doesn't include some of the other areas around Indonesia. Um, the, the blue is French, the blue with the three fleur-de-lis. The three-striped flag is Dutch, and then the, the red cross here and here, that's British. So it gives you an idea of these various companies, and you'll notice where the focus is. Around the south end, where most of the spice trade, um, that's where all of the routes that I showed you earlier in terms of spice routes, and you'll notice that uh, Sri Lanka was pretty much covered with foreigners in terms of the number of people there for the trade. The Dutch, especially later on, um, the Dutch East Indies became Indonesia and some of the other islands around there. And so we will talk about that. But these are some of the major colonies that ended up being European settlements for trade purposes in India. Now let's talk about the Portuguese East India Company first. <coughs> This was the most short-lived and ill-fated of all of the East India companies. This is their, um, their seal, uh, the thing that they used on their flag. The, each of these places had their own flag. They were, they were quasi-governments in their own right. Although Portugal did not have as much support from the government as some of the others did. This is an image of Vasco, Vasco da Gama as he was exploring around the African coast and then came up into, because he was the first one. He was the one that began it all. Um, Philip III of Portugal decided fairly early on that um, he needed to do something in the early 1600s to defend Portugal's interests, especially in the South Asia trade, against the growing influence, especially of the Dutch and British. And in fact, 
they, there was a lot of conflict between the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British, especially. It was a time called the uh, Iberian Union from the 1580s to the 16, to 1640, a 60-year period, in which the, the heirs to the throne of Portugal and to the throne of Spain were the same person. And so the Iberian Union was a period of time in there in which Spain and Portugal were under the same crown, under the same king. Well, Portugal already had a global empire. Spain was probably the, they had the greatest navy up to that point, up until 1588. But initially, the Dutch and the British considered themselves at war with the, uh, the Iberian Union, the Portuguese and, and the Spanish. There was a lot of trade going on. In fact, in Portugal, the king did give a royal monopoly. He, he uh, set up this East India Company, and he had a monopoly on coral, pepper, cinnamon, um, ebony, cowrie shells, other spices. In fact, the company that he set up, the Royal East India Company of Portugal, had a right to identify other items that they, they could claim a monopoly on. They also had a right, under the crown of the Iberian Union, Portugal and Spain, to seize British or Dutch ships and to claim their cargo as their own um, the, with the spoils. Just 20% of it had to go to the crown. So 20% of any of the ships value that they captured had to go to the crown. The Portuguese guaranteed to any investors in their activities a 4% return per year and that wasn't all that attractive. The Dutch uh, East India's company, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, they produced an 18% return for all of their investors every year for over 200 years. So, 18%, if y'all looked at what investments give you these days. So, but the 4%, very few Portuguese were really that interested in it. And so, they started adding things. For instance, they said if you invest in this, you receive an honorary title in the king's household. You officially become part of the king's household. Uh, you will receive protect, protection from the government from any debt seizure. People can't claim your property if you owe them money. You will get a portion of any of the victims of the Inquisition's property. Oh. <laughs> Spanish Inquisition, right? Anybody gets taken in for that, their property was confiscated. You get a share of that and other measures of protection from the government. It still didn't work. They still couldn't get hardly anybody to invest in this. The company, the government had invested in it, and a few other people, but it was unsuccessful, it was unprofitable, and it only lasted five years before they shut it down. Now, and this was a time when Portugal was one of the great seafaring nations. They did establish, as I mentioned, some uh, Macau, which is uh, was for a long time a Portuguese colony, in China, and then Goa, which was a Portuguese colony here on the west coast of uh, India. But Portugal didn't stay in the game very long. And as I say, there were a lot of other things that came along in their history that caused them not to have really the resources or the energy for that. The next one we have um, is the Dutch East India Company. And in Dutch, the United East India Company is Verenigde Oost Indische Compagnie, which is VOC. And they became known as the VOC, which means United East India Company in Dutch. They began in 1602, just two years after the, the organization of the British East India Company. They were, um, they were very significant. In fact, in terms of overall resources and the people that they hired, over a million Europeans were hired by the VOC and taken you know, for employment to Southeast, South Asia to work in the various trade functions and things of that sort. Um, it, it's often said that the VOC was, the Dutch East India Company, was the first multinational corporation, the first example of e uh, economically driven globalization. They, uh, they were the first company ever to issue stocks and bonds for profitability. As I say, they, pr they produced 18% return in their, for their stockholders every year for 200 years. They were a mega corporation. Um, in fact, I saw one chart that compared the value of Apple computers and Microsoft and Google, etc., with the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch East India Company was something like 10 times as valuable in terms of their overall um, value as a company to Apple computers. They were an extraordinary powerhouse. They were licensed by the government. They were sort of a, an economic arm of the government of the Netherlands, and the government had given them the authority to wage war, to imprison and execute convicts, 
to negotiate individual treaties, to issue its own money. They printed coins and printed paper money, or uh, press coins and printed paper money, and they could establish colonies wherever they wanted. Um, they were a leader in corporate-led globalization, as I said. The, um, the government of the Netherlands really looked to them as being sort of an extension of the government. They were a military, political, economic complex. And in 1619, because Indonesia and the Spice Islands, as they're called, which are, are just off the main islands there, they were, um, they claimed Indonesia as the Dutch East Indies. They took over a city there, which they renamed uh, Batavia and made it their capital, and it is the modern city of Jakarta. That was the home base for the Dutch East, East India Company. Um, can't read my own writing. Again, they were the most valuable in their heyday of all of the East India Companies. The only th uh, later on, they ended up running into problems as well because the the Netherlands went to war with in, in a couple of different wars with England and did not fare so well, and so they ended up kind of have to draw back. But this gives you a map of some of the trade routes that they had. You'll notice that uh, Sri Lanka, golly, where we're going to go, was a major center of them for them. Also, Macau, uh, Nagasaki, over in uh, Japan especially over in Indonesia, the Spice Islands, as they were called, Jakarta was their headquarters, uh, but they also had routes that went up into the, um, the area which we think of as the, the, the incense routes up in here, and this map, as you can see, they carry the goods all the way around to Cape Town and the southern point of, of, Af of Africa was a major center for them, sort of a transition point, and they were centered in Amsterdam. And so, um, very powerful uh, navy that they had supporting them at that time. Again, the Netherlands seems like a very small country to us. We don't appreciate the fact, as with Portugal, that there was a time when they were a major international military and political power. Um, unfortunately, there were neg negatives, real downsides to the Dutch East Indies Company. They created a monopoly. They were, um, they've been accused of a, of a negative kind of colonialism where they did not allow the growth and development of the local people. Exploitation, for instance, they uh, used slavery to advance their causes there. And environmental destruction, the worst possible thing they did was they killed the dodo. Aww. The Dutch East India Company, um, the sailors were responsible for the extinction of the dodo bird in the 1500s and the dodo was an indigenous bird to the island of Mauritius and they um, the stories are that the dodo was so friendly it would just walk up and say hello well the, the, the dodo weighed about 30 pounds or so and so they started killing them and the dodo only laid one egg at a time and they would take the eggs and they caused the extinction the sailors from the Dutch East India Company caused the extinction of the dodo we're not even completely sure what it looks like. There are drawings of it, but some of the drawings are very different. This is probably the best representation we have of the dodo. And the idea that you drive an animal to extinction is pretty insane to me. Anyway, um, the next one I want to talk about is the French East India Company. The French East India Company started in 1664, so it was about 60 years behind, 64 years behind the British East India Company, and it was primarily formed in order to provide competition with the British. I don't know if you've ever noticed, the British and the French don't always get along. <laughs> well, the French saw the British taking advantage of all of this international trade opportunity, and they weren't going to have that. So they created the French East India Company, and the French King Henry IV gave them a 15-year monopoly to develop the trade routes and uh, things like that. Well. They were pursuing trade, and there was a lot of conflict. You know, as I say, the the, the Dutch especially was fighting against fighting against the French um, and the the British. So there was a lot of that kind of problem. But then finally, I talked about the Mughal Empire, right? The Muslim Empire that was involved in the 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 last of the great empires in India. Well, when the Mughal Empire started declining, France decided to get involved not just in trade but also politically. They started trying to control the political events in the vacuum that was created with the fall of the Mughals. The Mughals were defeated by a group called the Marathas, which were from, from further south, 
they're the ones that further south that the Mughals couldn't defeat, and that's why they didn't control the southern tip. While the Mughals, while they defeated, uh, or the uh, Marathas, while they defeated the Mughals, they weren't really, there was still a vacuum there. And so in 1741, the French start getting very aggressive to try to control politically the area left by the vacuum from the Mughal fall. And they got aggressive not only with Indians, but with the British. When they started pushing the British, the British decided to push back. And there was a, uh, the head of, or the military head of the British East India Company at that time was a guy named Robert Clive. You ever heard of Clive of India? <coughs> anybody? <coughs> Never heard of Clive of India? Okay, Any, anybody? Yes, okay. Anybody from a British background or with British, British education would know Clive of India. Um, he, he's a, he's a, he was a major leader. Well, he defeated the, the French in a series of battles and uh, pretty much drove them out. They did maintain some centers on the, the east coast, which is not the more valuable coast of, um, of India. In fact, the, the Pondicherry and Chandernagore, they maintained until the 1950s as being French outposts. But for the most part, they got pushed out of it and after Robert Clive sort of kicked them around the, the subcontinent, they were not financially successful. They finally were abolished in 1769, but again, the French posts that they maintained on, on the East Coast continued until the 1950s. So they still had a presence there, but those were not the real prime locations because they, they were not the spice centers. It's the West Coast of India, the, the Malabar Coast, where we have just been, Cochin, that was really important. In 1785, after they'd been out of business for about 16 years, they tried to reconstitute it because they still saw some potential in this part of the world. But unfortunately, they were just a few years away from the French Revolution. And while the king in 1785 declared again a monopoly for the crown to get back into this area, after just five years in 1790, the French Revolution had taken over and they declared there would be no monopoly because part of the principles of the French Revolution was equality. And so everybody had an opportunity to go and take advantage of this. Um, it didn't really, you know, that didn't work out. And in 1770, uh, 1794, the uh, French East India Company was officially done away with, okay? Now we come to the big boy in the block. This is the British East India Company. It is, was the first one to be formed in 1600, although it didn't get its legs under itself until for a while. But it is the longest lasting and the most important in terms of overall impact, not just trade, but political impact, uh, cultural impact, and everything else. It was known just as the East India Company. In fact, um, I was shown a book this afternoon. Somebody had picked up a book called the East India Company. Well, it was about the British East India Company. Usually, if you just hear East India Company, it means the British, because it's the one that lasted longest and had the most effect. Although all of the others were East India companies as well. Um, the East India Company, the British East India Company, was also known colloquially as John Company. That it was the biggest employer in Britain. It, everybody wanted a job with the uh, East India Company. It was very lucrative. There were a lot of benefits that you had. For instance, all of the main facilities that the, uh, the British East India Company had in the various ports and colonies, all of the buildings had nap rooms. You could take a nap if you wanted to. You know, plus they would provide free food, transportation, there were a lot of benefits. Plus you could strike your own trade deals. You could arrange to make purchases of spices and things like that, transport them back, have them sold for you, and a lot of people got very rich doing this sort of thing. The original name of the British East India Company was the Governor and Company of Merchants of London Trading into the East Indies. So we'll just call it the East India Company. The, uh, it rose in order to, um, to create an opportunity for Britain. Eventually, after the Dutch East India Company had, had declined and receded, were defeated in war by the British, Almost half of the world's trade at one time was being conducted by the British East India Company. And uh, their charter began on the 31st of December, 1600. And the reason for that date is 1588. Does anybody know what happened in 1588? The Spanish Armada was defeated by uh, Admiral Lord Nelson. And by the way, I mentioned this to somebody upstairs. Um, what's that? Sorry, Nelson. 
Drake. Um, Drake. Drake. Okay. That um, yeah, even the best. There were some of the great admirals that that they had in the British Navy that suffered terribly from seasickness. So if you feel a little unstable um, on, on this ship, don't worry about it. And a lot of great people had um, had seasickness. Well, they, they the charter in 1600 was by Queen Elizabeth I, and they began to uh, trade in cotton, silk, indigo, salt, spices, saltpeter, tea, opium. For the first century that they existed, throughout the 17th century, they really were not involved in expansion or any sort of governmental or military control. They weren't trying to build an empire. They were just focusing on trade. But then, as I say, in the 18th century, when the Mughal Empire fell, they, they ended up having to whip up on the French and get them out of the way. At that point, with the Mughals gone, they didn't have that political control. The French were thrown out of it. They were not going to have any influence. At that point, the British East India Company started to take on an expansionist, imperialistic kind of approach. Uh, by 1803, the army of the British East India Company had twice as many soldiers as the British Army. To give you some idea, in 1750, they had 3,000 soldiers, and they were primarily just guards for the activities uh, in, the, in the, the outposts of the British East India Company. Uh, 13 years later, they had gone from 3,000 to 26,000. By 1778, they were at 67,000. By 1837, they were at 280,000 soldiers. They had infantry, cavalry, artillery, horse artillery. Again, they were more than twice as large as the whole rest of the British Army. Now, most of these were Indian sepoys that were trained in a special military academy training school, um, trained in British military form, um, but they were, and they were not allowed to be officers. The British, uh, the British insisted that only British could be officers. There was never a situation where an Indian sepoy soldier, no matter how good they were, could rise to the point where they were a superior over any British officers. That was not allowed, and I think that's very consistent with the sort of superiority thing that we find. Eventually, they ended up with uh, irregularities in their finances. Well, by the way, this gives you an idea. This is in the early 1700s. This is in the late 1800s in terms of, of the amount of area that the British East India Company controlled. Now, this isn't another government, this is a company, although it was sort of pseudo-government. They also, in addition to all the soldiers I mentioned, they also had a fleet of armed merchant vessels, which were called East Indiamen, and a, a fleet of warships that all belonged to the East India Company. There was, um, here you see the Maratha Confederacy. Um, they're the ones that had started in the south and then worked their way north and ended up defeating the the Mughals as they went along. There, later on, the British had three wars against the Marathas, the Anglo-Marathas wars, and they, um, they defeated them after they, the Marathas had defeated the Mughal Empire. There was another kingdom called Mysore down here in the south, uh, which by, by the end of the 19th century has shrunk considerably, but there were two sultans there. Uh, the last one was the Tipu Sultan, and the, that hated the British, fought against the British, and he was, he was a pretty sharp guy. He not only had a lot of allies, he not only had a very effectively trained military, his military was trained by the French, and he even had some French mercenaries that fought for him, but he was one of the first, had one of the first armies in the world that actively used rockets against the British when they fought the wars, and that's why it didn't just, you know, they didn't just defeat them outright. They ended up taking quite a bit of time to defeat the kingdom. There were four Anglo-Mysore wars. Now, between 1757 and 1857, the East, British East India Company came to control the entire subcontinent of India. Um, you know, over further Burma and areas there, Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka or Ceylon is what it's called at that time, and further up into um, Baluchistan and up into what is the corner of modern day Afghanistan. They, in 1820, there was a massive cholera epidemic. Lest we think it was all, you know, light and roses for these British soldiers, there was an 1820 cholera epidemic in which 10,000 British officers died. A lot of Indians died as well. But um, they said that in the 75 years between 1760 and 1834, only 10% of the officers, British officers, 
of the East India Company survived to sail home again. Only 10%, 90% of them died in India. Now in 1773, and this is one of the real dark spots, in 1773 the British had set up a monopoly on growing opium in India for sale in China. And it was very lucrative. In fact, the amount of money the British were paying for tea was pretty much offset by the amount of money they were making from selling opium in, opium in China. Well, the Chinese recognized the damage this was doing and they outlawed opium. Well, at that point, the East India Company started selling the opium to Indian smugglers with the understanding that they could only sell it in China. And so there was a, a period of time um, a period of about 40 years in which Indian op opium smugglers, supported by the British East India Company, were taking opium into China. By 1838, they were smuggling 1,400 tons of opium a year. At that point, the Chinese decided they had to take stiffer action, and so they declared that, th that anyone who was caught smuggling opium would suffer the death penalty. In response to that, you know, the smugglers were not wanting to smuggle then, and so that was cutting into the income for the East India Company. So the British launched two opium wars against China to force them to allow the import of opium. Um, in 1839 to 42 and 1856 to 60. Um, as if that weren't bad enough, there were a number of famines that occurred during this same period of time in India. And the a primary reason for these famines, there were three major famines, the primary reason for the famines is because the people were not growing grain because the British were forcing them to grow opium. You can't survive on opium. And so it even led to famines in India. Um, and the British got what they wanted. The uh, government of China ended up finally agreeing to let the, let the opium in. But what happened then is because it was then now available, it wasn't having to be bought illegally, the price dropped so significantly that it was no longer as profitable to have India grow opium. And they started shipping opium in from Turkey and other places where, where it was less expensive. And so India got out of the opium growing business at that point. You know, that's not, they're not a major source for opium anymore, as some other countries are. But it was not the brightest light in, um, in the British history. We then have um, a major rebellion occurs in India in 1857. And it was primarily the Indian sepoys, the Indian soldiers who worked for the British East India Company. And the reason, um, there was a lot of dissatisfaction, but the primary reason for this is fascinating. In the mid-1850s, the British introduced a new kind of rifle cartridge. If you've ever watched any of the movies where, you know, from that time period, they were uh, muzzle-loaded guns, but they introduced one, a, a single cartridge that was uh, in paper. And the soldier had, would bite off the bullet from the paper. There was gunpowder in it. He would pour the gunpowder down the barrel, push the paper in there and ramrod that down, and then spit the bullet into the barrel and ramrod that down. Well, to keep it from getting wet, because gunpowder doesn't work so well when it's wet, they grease, they used grease on these paper cartridges. They were greased cartridges. Well, the word got out, all of the Mysore Indian soldiers of the British East India Company were either Hindus or Muslims. The Hindus got the word that they had used fat from cows to grease these cartridges. The Muslims began to, the rumor went around that they had used the fat of pigs to grease these cartridges. Well, when the British introduced these, the Muslims were not gonna bite this off and use it, and you had to bite it off to make it work, because they thought that it was pig fat. And the Hindus wouldn't do it because they thought it was cow fat, and the cow was sacred in, in Hindus. So, 85% of the soldiers that were issued these cartridges refused them. And so, the British arrested everyone that refused the cartridges, and put them in jail, and that led to a massive uprising all the way across India. Well, it took them over a year, the British East India Company, to put down that rebellion. It's sometimes called the, the Sepoy Revolt or the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Once it was all over and they had put down the rebellion pretty, pretty drastically in terms of the, the means that they used, um, the people in Britain, including the British government, 
blamed East India Company for the problem. They said, you handled this so poorly, it's your fault. And so they, they said, you're out of business. They formally, uh, well, in 1858, the East India Company was taken over by other government officials. It still existed in a minor state because they were um, still providing, for instance, they were guarding St. Helena, you know, the, the place where the East India Company was guarding where Napoleon had been exiled to. And so there were a number of other minor functions. But in um, 1874, they officially closed out the British East India Company and forced them to pay out the value of the company to all of their investors. And then a great deal of it was taken over by the British government. So they officially came to an end in 1874. After all of this, the British were trying to, they were not wanting to lose India. And in order to figure out how to control it, that's why they created what was called the British Raj where the uh, Disraeli, the Prime Minister, announced to Queen Victoria she had now become the Empress of, of India. And so Raj is the Hindi word for king. Uh, but they, they were, it was now a royal protectorate. And from that point, it goes on. I'm going to pick all of that up when I talk about the British, uh, the, the jewel in the crown in British India. But in terms of a legacy from the East India Company, um, there was some positive things. Literacy increased. There was, um, although they had some famines, overall health care and some other things increased. But, and, and it, you know, for those who were part of the British Empire, it definitely stimulated the British Empire. The reason why the British were so reluctant to lose control in India is because it was so valuable as a colony. Uh, there was so much wealth coming out of there and so, so much influence. This, during the periods of time, this is why the British went to war to protect the Suez Canal, because that was their primary shortcut route to get to India. They didn't really care much about the rest of the Red Sea, but they definitely wanted to be able to get to India, because it's the jewel in the crown. Um, so it stimulated growth, and the armies of the British East India Company were later absorbed into the British Army, and they were used in Asia as needed. Um, and it was a major factor in introducing English as, a, as one of the formal languages in Britain. But at the same time, oh, and by the way, they were the first one to record that orange-flavored tea that they drank in China, which led to the development of Earl Grey tea. Earl Grey, hot, right? So the East India Company introduced another positive as they introduced a merit-based promotion system. Now, if you were Indian, you still couldn't get above a certain level. But rather than promote people based upon buying their commissions, which was the standard of the British Army, if you wanted to be an officer in the British Army, depending upon what rank you wanted, you paid for it. You didn't have to have any military training. You did not, you did not get promoted because you were worth it. You had to buy the position. Well, the East India Company introduced a merit-based uh, appointment system, which later on was adopted by the British once they got rid of the purchasing your, um, your commissions. Problems were widespread corruption led to the real looting of resources and treasures from throughout India under this time. Um, there were, as I said, several famines in 1770 and again in the 18th and 19th century mostly caused by the policy of the, of the uh, British East India Company, like forcing the people to grow opium. There was a uh, a significant sense in which the people were not allowed to develop in the way they could. The biggest, the biggest problem with all of the colonial influences, and I've seen this especially in Africa where I spent a lot of time, is the colonial powers came in, they maintained all the authority, they maintained all the administrative responsibilities, and then when the time came, they just left, and they left behind no one who had been trained in how to do these things. And so that's why many of the countries that had been colonial um, controlled by colonial powers, ended up struggling so desperately for uh, sometimes generations after that. And the same thing was true in India, although they have recovered. Again, here is this map, which gives you the Portuguese, the white with the shield, the blue with the three fleur-de-lis is French, um, the Dutch is the tricolor, red, white, and blue, um, the English is the red cross, and then there are a couple of Danish on here, which is the red background with a white cross although they were primarily in other places. So, obviously there is still a massive presence um, left over from the colonial times. The language, the culture, the buildings. How many buildings did you see that the guides were saying, okay, this is a, you know, a British colonial building, you can tell from the design. 
So there's still a, an enormous amount of influence here, although these countries all have their own independence now, and India becoming independent in the late 1940s. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Your first uh, slide show all the trade going around the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a serious effort to go through the Red Sea, get up to where the Suez Canal is now, go overland there, and offload then to go into the Mediterranean? Yes, there was. The question is, was there ever an effort? I mean, uh, some of these charts really abbreviate. They'll sort of show going in there and then and then back out. There has always been trade through the Red Sea that then goes overland from there. Um, there, in several ways, there, there was a time when there was a lot of trade that went through the Red Sea up to kind of the closest area, and then they went overland to the Nile and went up the Nile uh, because the Nile's big enough to carry, you know, to, to have ships that can carry a lot of load. And so, yes, they did a lot of through the Red Sea and even up into the Persian Gulf because from the Persian Gulf they then could reach some of the Middle Eastern powers and then get over into Europe as well. So there were overland routes, but this is primarily just, you know, it focused on where the maritime uh, maritime routes were. Yes? Uh, so, uh, so that my comment to the question, uh, the comment being that uh, there's quite a parallelism to the uh, Hudson Bay Company, whose only competitor were the French and the Right. Tell us something about the, the trading practice. Were goods brought to the trading post, or the British actually moving into the, uh, the background of right. their commodities? So first, his comment, which is true, in North America, the Hudson Bay Company was an officially established trading company uh, that Britain set up, and they competed with the French. Um, some of the early wars, you know, the French and Indian Wars and other things had to do with control of the trade in North America, especially fur trade at that time. So, and there is a, there is a parallel there, although it was a much bigger deal here than it was in, in North America. Um, in terms of how the British did this, they were actively involved in, in accessing, you know, the tr because some of this was inland, of accessing crops and things like that, but they did maintain, I mean, the reason for this is that these were all of their port trading centers. And so it was from these locations that the various countries would ship out the goods to take them back to, you know, where they would be sold. Um, but they were actively involved. I mean, they were running the whole country. Uh, the, the, the British East India Company in their, in their heyday, they, they were administrative, they had administrative responsibilities for the entire country, everything about it. They were the legal system. They were the military. They were the police force. Uh, they, they had Indians working for them, but they controlled all of that. So they you know, controlled really all aspects of the trade process as well. They didn't just wait and have it brought to them and then load it on ships. They were doing all of it. They were inland as well. Yes? What was the rate of return for the British What was the rate of return for the British East, East Indies? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't, it was, it was hugely lucrative. But because of, later on, inefficiencies and even corruption, one of the reasons why one by one the East India companies failed is because the, you know, the bosses back home, the governments back home, began to lose faith in them and, and thought, we can do that, there's a better way to do this because you guys aren't making the money you should be making. Early on especially, it, you know, there were massive fortunes to be made by everybody involved in it, and that's why they did it. But then that became less efficient over time um, as more and more people got into the business and the, you know, the price margins went down on some of this stuff. And you know, human beings are greedy. People were, were skimming off the top and that's why most of these ended up coming to an end. In the case of the British East India Company, it was because they lost confidence over the way the government administration, which the British East India Company was responsible for, the way that was being conducted. But in terms of the of dollar figures or pounds or euros or whatever, I can't really give you a number, sorry. Any other questions? Yes? Right. Uh, I think it is. The, the expression, bite the bullet, where did that come from? Um, doing something unpleasant, because one of the things when you bit that bullet, you ended up tasting the gunpowder and the grease, and you know, it was not very pleasant, and those, um, those muzzle loaders, when they fired them, they then would have to put just a, a, a touch of the gunpowder in, in the, the frizzin, in the, in the firing plate. And when they fired, 
you literally have an explosion of gunpowder and so it would burn the side of your face and you would have gunpowder stains on your face. It was not a very pleasant thing. Has anybody read any of Bernard Cornwell's books about Sharps rifles? Okay. Um, or seen the TV shows. There was a British TV series that did like six or seven of them and, and a couple of those books have to do with the defeat of the Tipu Sultan, for instance. And the, the main hero, as is always the case, the main hero's name is Richard Sharp. He's an enlisted man in Britain who, because he saves the life of Wellington, he, he's made a junior officer and then ends up growing up in the ranks. Well, he killed the Tipu Sultan. He was the guy that ended up, when the British attacked the Mysore and the, the Sultan was killed, he's the character, you know, the one who killed him. Anyway, if you like historical novels, and you can learn a lot from historical novels, unlike historical movies. <laughs> um, Bernard Cornwell is a wonderful historian, as well as being just a crackerjack writer. And so af after uh, his earliest books were the war, the Napoleonic Wars, the Peninsular Campaign in Portugal and Spain. And so there are books on each of the major campaigns there. And then you can go back and read the books. Uh, he wrote those later about, um, you know, there's one that has to do with the trip to Denmark where the British went up to destroy the, the Danish um, fleet so that the French couldn't get it, uh, um, and then there's Battle of Waterloo is in there and everything else. They're, they're just a crackerjack read, so, aren't they? <laughs> yes, okay. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Enjoy tomorrow in Sri Lanka. <laughs>